And now for the most famous words in motorsports, the Grand Marshal of the 43rd Pepsi 400 at Daytona, Miss Britney Spears. Alan Bestwick, Benny Parsons, and Wally Dollenbach. Thank you, Bill. With Benny, the 1975 Daytona 500 winner, and Wally Dollenbach, who's run some 226 Winston Cup races, including just three weeks ago at Pocono. And Wally, when I think of tonight's race, the words intense and heart pounding come to mind. How about it? There's a couple more. Stressful. This is one of the most stressful races that we run all year. You've got the fear factor, fear of the big wreck. You have frustration, frustration of being stuck in that line that's not moving. And hopefully some, somewhere along the line that 400 miles, you get to have a little bit of fun. Benny, the drivers all day long have been talking about the big wreck, capital B, capital W. What is the big wreck? Anytime you come to Daytona Talladega and these cars run, it's huge used packs. We'll see 43 cars run together. And when that happens, if something happens in front of you, you cannot avoid. Here, Tony Stewart gets tagged by Ward Burton up on top of Robbie Gordon. These guys behind down through the grass are trying to avoid it, but you simply can't. You're running too fast. These cars are too close together. That's the big wreck. You see them all there together. It's allowed to happen at any time, Alan. 19 cars taken out in that one that happened with just 27 laps to go in the Daytona 500 in February. And the closer we get to the end of the race, the more likely a possibility that big wreck is. The sights, the sounds, the rush of adrenaline that is NASCAR at Daytona is coming up next. The starting lineup in green flag for the 43rd Pepsi 400 coming up on NBC. NBC's coverage of the Pepsi 400 is brought to you by Pepsi, the choice of victory lane by Dodge and nearly 3,000 dealers who invite you to come see what's new. By Kellogg's, the official breakfast food of NASCAR. And by Budweiser, with the crisp, clean, refreshing taste you'll find in no other beer, this Bud's for you. Some 180,000 fans are packed into the Daytona International Speedway waiting for the start of the 43rd Pepsi 400 field rolling off onto the track for a couple of pace laps before the green flag. Budweiser, the official beer of NASCAR, is the proud sponsor of the Bud Pole Award, given to the fastest qualifier at each NASCAR Winston Cup race. This week it was Sterling Marlin, who grabbed his 11th pole position. Nine drivers have won Bud Pole Awards in 15 tries this season. They'll be in the Bud Shootout in 2002. Since 1979, Anheuser-Busch has awarded more than $7 million as title sponsor of NASCAR's Pole Award program. 43 drivers are getting ready to go at it in the Pepsi 400. Why don't we take a look at the Walmart starting grid. Sterling Marlin, his 11th pole position, leading a Dodge sweep of the top four spots. Ward Burton was running strong in the Daytona 500 until he got taken out in a wreck late in the race. Inside row three, Jeff Gordon, the leader of the NASCAR West Cup point standings. He's won the Pepsi 400 twice. On the inside of row seven, John Andretti, the Pepsi 400 winner in 1998. Mark Martin is one of the five drivers who can earn a million dollar bonus with the win tonight. Kevin Harvick, first start for RCR Daytona. Jeff Purvis, great qualifying run and only his second Winston Cup start of the season. He's in row six. Dale Earnhardt Jr. goes from 13th. He finished second here in February in the 500. He'll be the sentimental favorite to win. And 60-year-old Dave Marcus makes his 63rd Daytona start tonight. On the outside of row nine, Bill Elliott. 
says his team gave up speed in qualifying for comfort in the race and trying to win the race. Dale Jarrett won this race two years ago. He's second in the championship to Jeff Gordon. Ricky Rudd, one of the hottest drivers on the circuit right now. He makes his 50th Daytona start tonight, but he's never won here. Daytona 500 winner, Michael, starts 22nd. Rusty Wallace back in row number 12 along with Mike Skinner. The 13th row, it's Rockingham winner Steve Park. He has to come from deep in the field along with the 94 Pepsi 400 winner Jimmy Spencer of Pennsylvania. Spencer starting back in row 14. And on the inside of row 15 is Terry Labonte. He's two-time series championship. He was fast in last night's practice. He'll need to be from that spot. Jeff Burton, the defending winner of this race. Both the Gibbs racing cars will start way back. Bobby Labonte, 33rd, and Tony Stewart in 36th. Now the drivers who got provisional spots to get into the field weren't quick enough to qualify on time. Johnny Benson led this race late last year. He and his teammate Ken Schrader try to draft through the traffic together from row 19 and row 20. And we look at the rest of those who got in on their points. Mike Wallace back behind the wheel of Jim Smith's Ford Taurus. And Brett Bodine got the final starting spot. He was a nervous, nervous man pacing around at the end of qualifying here yesterday. Look at those who failed to qualify. Ron Hornaday and A.J. Foyt's car not here. Buckshot Jones. Ran really strong in practice, just didn't go when he needed it to in qualifying. He's among the five who will watch this race instead of being in it. Track description of the Daytona National Speedway. See that lake you're looking at behind the graphic? All the dirt that used to be where the water is now was used to make the 31 degree banking of this racetrack that is some four stories tall from bottom to top that these race cars rocket around at some 190 miles an hour. And there you can see those that 31 degrees as these cars come through there. Now the race analysis and the key number in this one will be pit window. 50 to 55 laps per fuel. Some guys tell me they can only run 50 laps. If they can't do that, they have to stop three times. The guys that can run 53 laps can make this race on two stops if it should go green flag all the way. Down to pit road, here's Bill Weber. Thank you, Alan. This track is two and a half miles long and there will be plenty of wild action out there on the big track. But look at the pit stalls on pit road. They're a little over 15 feet wide and just over 29 feet long and there will be plenty of wild action there as well. Who has the best pit stall? Well, pit stalls are selected in the qualifying order. So the argument would be that Sterling Marlin has the best pit stall. You want easy in, easy out. He's got both. And you have to watch the timing line so you don't get a speeding penalty. The checkered flag falls on the track. But here at Daytona, the race could be won on pit road. Here's Dave Burns. Bill, we haven't talked yet about the defending race champion, Jeff Burton. Remember, he and his Roush stablemates have all gotten increased horsepower from their R&D department since the Texas race this year. They will be looking strong. And, and uh, Mark Martin and Jeff Burton are also in the Noble 5 program. So talk about incentive, an extra million dollars for those two. Let's go to Marty. Dave, last Friday, Dale Earnhardt Jr. in effect became the man of the Earnhardt family when he walked his sister Kelly down the aisle for her wedding, a job that was originally scheduled for his father. Now at the track that claimed his father's life, Dale Jr. looks to assume another role, becoming the man of the Winston Cup Series at Daytona. He has a fast car, just enough experience, and tonight, most likely, a little help from above. Can Dale Jr. dominate Daytona like dear old dad used to? Only time will tell, but tonight, he might get a good start. To Matt Yoakum. Marty Ward Burton will start the 22 car from the second position. He's racing for restrictor plate redemption. He led the most laps in the season opening Daytona 500 only to be crashed out while leading at Talladega. He lost the lead and the race when he overshot his pit. He says he feels like he's due. What better way to get your first Winston Cup restrictor plate win than here at Daytona. His best finish seventh three times. That's in the last three Pepsi 400s. He feels like tonight he's due, and this could be his best shot ever. Alan? About a half a lap from the start of the Pepsi 400. Those nine Dodges in the field are heavily concentrated toward the front of the pack. Dodge has not won here at Daytona since 1977. Is tonight the night, Benny? I think it could be. I really believe it will be because 
Sterling Marlin, Ward Burton, two really fast cars in the Daytona 500. And I don't see why, I haven't seen anything that tells me they've slowed down any. One of my favorite points of these night races here at Daytona, the flash bulbs just exploding from the grandstand on this last pace lap. Fans all taking their memento pictures. And for these drivers, Wally, their last moment of peace and quiet. Yeah. It's about to get very tense. Yeah, the uh, hornet's nest is supposed to uh, open up here. Just a second. It's going to be great. Your thoughts. You're in turn three. You're inside the race car. They're what? Well, you know, it depends on where you're at. But really, I, I'd rather be on the outside here in the outside lane, only because when you come out of turn two, everybody's going to start diving down to the bottom. So you have to protect your line. So. Hopefully I'm in the top line and I'm just going to ride. Hopefully get through the next couple laps, get things sorted out. You see so many cars passed on the inside here at Daytona and at Talladega. A lot of these teams have installed little mirrors, little spot mirrors on the roll bar where the driver can look out a rear view mirror beside the car and see if someone is beside him. 20 straight weeks of racing to decide the NASCAR Winston Cup Series champion begin now. The crowd is on its feet. The 43rd Pepsi 400 goes green on NBC. through the field off the second corner. Mike Skinner saw an opening in the middle and dove three wide, trying to pick up some spots. The yellow line on the bottom of the race, the out-of-bounds line. Think of it like the sideline of the football field. The drivers were told in their pre-race meeting, go below that, you're going to be penalized by NASCAR. And that's really what got us in trouble a lot in past before they made that rule. Because what would happen is guys would go below that line, they would get back up on the racetrack and if there was three or four abreast there there was no room ward burton leads lap one jeff gordon squeezing underneath kevin harvick harvick in the white car on board with harvick junior limacek is in the 33 car his first race back since richmond in may he crashed practice with bush car at dover and he's been trying to heal all this time. Casey Atwood in the 19, the young 20-year-old from Nashville, being passed by Sterling Marlin for second. Not so fast. Our colleagues at Fox began a tradition of saluting the memory of Dale Earnhardt with a silent lap three. We feel it appropriate, and we're proud to carry that tradition on. to the lead. Three deep for sixth spot on down as Ward Burton gets shuffled back to fifth. Andy Houston, the rookie, going for the lead on the outside. Aston Drafton up with Joe Nemechek and put Houston in front. Alan, last night in, in uh, final practice, they made some changes to the 96 car. Andy said they, the changes they made, a spring in the right rear and also a sway bar change, helped that car tremendously. And even though he's lost the lead now, expect Andy Houston to handle a very comfortable race car up front all night long. Marlin back to the point. That's Ward Burton right behind him as you look out the back bumper of the Marlin car. 
front six now single file. Then they're two and three deep from there on back. That is the most important thing, a comfortable race car for this race. You know, this track probably has quite a bit less grip than it had in February. I think once the tires get a lot of heat, fuel burns off, this car's going to get to be a little bit more of a handful than right now. Stacy Compton in the 92 racing Joe Nemechek for third spot. I can't believe these guys can do this. Lap after lap after lap, side by side, three wide. <laughs> My fists are all clenched together up here. I can't imagine what it's like in the race car. Dodge, 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 front three. Then the Chevrolets of Kevin Harvick and Joe Nemechek. Also Mike Skinner in there in a Chevy. And Mike Skinner started 23rd in that number 31. Here comes Ricky Rudd. And Michael Waltrip, the Daytona 500 winner in the 15 car. Michael started back in 22nd spot. It's up to 8th, racing for 7th and 6th. Jeff Gordon. Let's see if he has to back off in the corner. Listen to his engine. Hasn't yet. And that's what he was working on last night. He told us in our coverage of the final practice, he was working on being able to run around the racetrack wide open, never having to crack the throttle. Waltrip in the 15, Rudd in the 28, Gordon in the 24, trying to advance the inside line by Skinner. That'd be for fifth position. the light blue car in the outside lane the 66 machine started in 31st position <laughs> we'll see that all night long cars coming from the back to the front shuffling back to the back coming back to the front it's one of the exciting things about this kind of racing yeah <laughs> exciting and sometimes very frustrating because just when you get up there and you go all right i'm going to get with the lead guys we're going to get in line and we're going to take off and all of a sudden they split you and you go right to the back and it's like that all night long Leader, Sterling Marlin, the silver car. Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart, the Joe Gibbs cars, both started deep in the field. They're both still running deep in the field. Let's go to Marty Snyder. And, Alan, that should be no surprise. I stood with Tony Stewart and Bobby Labonte right before the race. They had a little mini meeting. They said, listen, we're going to drop straight to the back. We're just going to ride there. In fact, they don't want to ride at the back of the pack. They want to ride beyond the back of the pack. They want to be away from the main pack to avoid what they think is going to be a big wreck this evening. Now, they've tried this strategy before, and every time they've tried it, it has backfired. They're hoping it won't backfire tonight. To Matt Yoakum. Marty Sterling Marlin spotter Lauren Rainier, son of the late Daytona 500 winning car owner Harry Rainier, told Sterling Marlin, drop back, you're getting too far out, try to stay more with the group, you're getting too far out, you're going to give them too much good air to make a run on you. He acknowledged that, it's a 10-4, and he hit the brakes, slowly backing up to let the 22 suck up on his bumper. The bill. Well, Dale Jarrett started this race in 19th position. He loves coming to Daytona. He actually likes racing here because he's had so much success. But despite starting 19th, not much success so far tonight. He's reported that his car is a little loose. It's also running hot in traffic. Water temperature 235. Last time by 32nd from his 19th starting spot. Kevin Harvick just went all the way to scrape the paint off the outside wall to take the lead from Sterling Marlin. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to watch these young, brave drivers driving around Daytona and Talladega? And listen to the roar of the fans. This was Dale Earnhardt's car. And here comes Dale Earnhardt's car. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, Michael Waltrip on the inside, trying to take that lead away from Kevin Harvick. Here's
Here's Waltrip, Harvick to block. You know, Kevin just did, took him out of the line, and he's gonna lose a lot of positions unless he can squeeze back in line right there. Marlin to the lead, Andy Houston to second, the McDonald's car there. Now Waltrip in third, Todd Lodine goes to fourth. And they're three deep from fifth on back. Oh man, oh man. We had 49 lead changes in the Daytona 500. We've already had four. And we're just in the opening laps of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. of 160 laps are now complete in the 43rd running of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Sterling Marlin is the leader. Michael Waltrip is second. Andy Houston is third. Todd Bodine fourth. Now they're mixing it up from back. Sixth position on back. You've got Ricky Craven in fifth. Mike Skinner in sixth. And now this race for seventh between Ward Burton in the 22 and Kevin Harvick in the 29. And look at that. Moving up, Mike Wallace started 42nd in that seven car. He is up to the 10th position of the game. 32 spots. And Mike's kind of fighting for his job here this weekend. This might be his last ride in that seven car. But again, he ran just like this in the Daytona 500. Ran terrific here in Talladega. Yeah, Talladega, he started dead last in the field. 43rd, finished ninth. Let's get more on Mike Wallace's race so far from Dave Burns. Well, and Alan Benny's right. He started 27th here in February and finished sixth. Now, I just talked with Jim Long, his crew chief, who said we knew the car was going to be good. We didn't expect it to be quite this good. I talked with car owner Jimmy Smith, and he said, hey, I spent a million dollars trying to get this thing to go fast by itself. It wouldn't. We had to take a provisional, but boy, it sure goes in a pack of cars. Back through Mike Wallace in 10th, now sorting out single file. I, I mean, you know, especially Mike's had to sit and watch somebody else drive his race car for the last couple of years. That, that's like seeing your wife out with somebody else. I mean, that, that is a terrible feeling watching your race car go around the racetrack without you in it. Three deep, that's Dale Earnhardt Jr. left of your screen. Kevin Harvick in the middle, Ricky Rudd down on the inside of the racetrack. And they're racing for 9th, 10th, and 11th spots. Now he lifted there. Yes, he did. Pit Road, Bill Weber. Just talked to Kevin Hamlin, the crew chief for Kevin Harvick. I asked him if they had any damage to the race car. He says he doesn't believe so. He's not certain because Kevin is not talking to them. Remember, he is a rookie. This is his first start in a Winston Cup race at Daytona. What Kevin thinks is that Kevin Harvick is focusing on trying to learn where to put the race car on the racetrack. Marty? Well, Bill, when Dell Jr. was just in that three-wide pack, his spotter Ty Norris said either get in front of them or let off and let Harvick go. He wants to get to the front. We don't need to be on the outside being three-wide. Let's take it easy. We've got a good car that can win the race. Be patient. It's early. <laughs> Telling a race driver to be patient behind the wheel of his car is an easy thing to do. It's a hard thing to make happen. All right, that yellow line as we go down the backstretch, that is out of bounds, just like... Alan told you at the very beginning, and this is going to be the toughest spot on the racetrack to avoid getting below that yellow line. Before the race is over, someone will be penalized for dipping down below that yellow line on the backstretch. Let's go back and look at that instance that Marty was reporting on a minute ago when Dale Earnhardt Jr. ran up on Kevin Harvick. He's pushing him. That's called a bump draft. You bump them a little bit and get them moving. And believe it or not, the cars run a little faster, bumping at 190 miles per hour. Now you could hear the, the, the engine note pick up a little bit as he gained a little speed when Earnhardt Jr. hit him and then drop off a little bit when Jr. pulled out from behind him. Mike Skinner in the 31, looking inside of Todd Bodine. Had a report a little earlier that Jeff Purvis's car was maybe overheating some. 51 machine is back to 24th spot now. He started in 11th. This is the race for fifth between Skinner and Todd Levine. You see the front four out ahead of them.
third place, side by side. Ward Burton up top, Andy Houston down low. Now that, that to me, if you had about five or six veterans up front, they would stay in line and try to break away from the rest of the pack. But we got some guys up there that are, are rookies and not familiar with it. They want to lead, and that's keeping that pack behind them up close to the leaders. I love it. I love to watch these guys pass each other. 20 laps complete of 160 in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Sterling Marlin and Michael Waltrip hold the top two spots. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. We come back to Daytona in the Pepsi 400 as Michael Waltrip makes a bid for the lead on Sterling Marlin. With help from Mike Skinner. Skinner pulled up behind that Chevrolet and to the front they went. Look at Sterling Marlin. They're all on the inside. He's lost two, three, four, five spots. Sterling Marlin has led the last 13 laps of the race. I think everybody's got the idea he's got a very strong car. He's waving his arm. He's waving his he's arm. Waving his head got. inside the car. He's got something wrong. Man, he can get run off. That one right behind you. His teammate Jason left from the 0 1 car. He couldn't get to pit road. Could it be that his car is just not right? Could it be that it's pushing or loose or just not right? And he's decided to go to the back and ride till they can make a pit stop and adjust them. I mean, in one lap, I mean, you know, he's Down leading low. the thing, Down and then all of a sudden, in one lap. Matt Yoakum, what's wrong with Sterling's car? Alan, talking to Lee McCall, Sterling Marlin's crew chief, he told me that Sterling's complaint is the car is very loose. He's going to try to drop back like a number of the other competitors and just ride in the back until the first round of pit stops somewhere along lap 52 to 55 to work on this race car. No need to chance anything right now because they have a very stout piece. There you have it, man. There you have right it. Right again. And that's smart racing. That is, that's just smart. We're barely 50 miles into a, not even 50 miles, into a 400 mile race. Now, off of turn number two, we're gonna show you our NBC speed trap. Actual, live, real-time speeds as the cars rocket off this corner at Daytona. Steve Park, fastest. New leader, Kevin Harvick. Takes up Richard Childress Chevrolet to the, to the top spot. And check out the battle for second spot as Harvick looks back at Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Michael Waltrip. The 8 and the 15, the two cars that battle for the victory in the Daytona 500. Ricky Rudd, first Ford in the order, and the 28. Daytona. Check out those fans. They are absolutely loving this as Bernard goes to the front. We talked all throughout the week what the young man's state of mind must be coming back here we talked about people going about business as usual. Benny, Dale Jr.'s put on the facade of business as usual, but I've detected through our interviews with him that this, that's not a facade. It has been business as usual. But I can also, also tell by the interviews, and I talked to Tony Uri <laughs> Sr., his team manager, this young man, Alan, wants this race as badly as he never want anything in his life. He wants this one today. Can you imagine what Victor thought? No, I can't even think about it. But we've got a long ways to go. Only 28 laps into this thing. There's Tony Urey. 
And Tony's reply to me was, I just hope he doesn't want it too much. Jeff Burton with a run up the outside. He started back in 30th spot. He's running sixth. There's Mike Wallace hanging on that trio of Chevrolets, a seven car in fourth spot. That'd be hard to fire your driver if he finished fourth, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that'd be pretty difficult. <laughs> There's Burton at 99. Andy Houston right behind him. Then you've got Matt Kenseth starting to move up. And Michael Walter, who was leading the race just a few laps ago, has now moved back to the seventh, eighth position. There's Jeff Burton, set a minute ago. Started back in 30th position. He's up in fifth now. And that's another driver that told me the day before the race, that's what he worked on last night in final practice. Get in the car where he could, where he would handle, where he could drive through the corners without backing off the accelerator. Jeff, it looks like it's working pretty good so far. The orange dot on the windshield designed to signify the five drivers who are running for the extra million dollar bonus. The Winston Noble Five bonus. They were the top five finishers in the Coca-Cola 600 at Charlotte Memorial Weekend. If one of those drivers wins the race tonight, they get a one million dollar bonus from the series sponsor. Plus a fan in the consumer contest also gets a million dollars. Marty Snyder has more on Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s race. And Alan, so far, he's been very calm on the radio. The only thing that he has said at Ty Norris's request, his spotter, is that the oil is at 230, the water's at 190. Very patient right now. He is leading the race. Now, the one thing that has started down here is pit strategy. Danny Lawrence, the engine builder for what used to be Dale Earnhardt's team, now Kevin Harvick's team, came down here. They're trying to plan when they're going to pit. The problem for Dale Jr.'s team is that they can only go about 50 laps on this first run. Most of the other teams can go about 55 laps on this first run. So Dale Jr. will probably come down pit road with Bobby Hamilton's team, even though Bobby's running way in the back of the pack because they are pitted right beside each other. Back up to Allen. Bobby Hamilton running in 35th position after 31 of 160 laps. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. NASCAR on NBC comes your way from Daytona International Speedway with live coverage of the Pepsi 400. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is out in front. Seven lead changes already in the opening 35 laps of this race. I think we're going to see a lot of spinning wrenches on these Dodges when they come in, Benny. I think, I think a lot of the cars are loose. Watching the last practice last night, I saw a lot of loose race cars, but it seems like the Dodges are suffering the most right now. Right now, the best Dodge is in 12th position. Oh, no, let's go back to about uh, the 13th position. John Andretti in the Hamburger Helper Dodge, the best Dodge. And remember, the first four qualifiers were Dodges. And in fact, five of the top 10 were Dodges. And now, as you said, Benny, and Redding in 13th is the best. Couple of Dodges riding around at the back of the field. Bill Elliott is in 43rd. He's last in the order. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Alan, down here in Ward Burton's pit, I spoke with crew chief Tommy Baldwin Jr. He says the car is just very loose in the center of the corner. They're gonna adjust this race car somewhere around lap 51 with air pressure. He said they've been fighting loose all during happy hour. They went into the race trying to adjust on that. Also, Lee McCall says his car is still very loose. Both cars have dropped outside of the top 19. Sterling just now moved up to 18, but both cars fighting loose conditions early on. And you saw the picture of Bill Elliott. There's Casey Atwood with the green bumper. And look how far back to his team car, Elliott. I mean, well, Elliott is in a lot of trouble. If I'm loose here, I want you to put some bite in the car. <laughs> I don't know if tire pressure is going to be enough, but uh, especially, you know, in traffic like, like you are with these cars, I think I'd be looking for some bite. Casey Atwood started fourth. He's in, right in front of Bill Elliott in 42nd. Compton started third. He's in 37th. And Ward back in 33rd. We can account for the front two rows. Well, Jeff Burton had moved up 
well up into the field from 30th spot. Now he's getting shuffled. He's just dropped six positions in that last lap back to 12th spot. There's another car that's loose. We're going to put a pound in the right rear. Looking inside. Just one look. Coming hard, though. Better take a pound out of the right rear, Frankie. He's loose. When you add air pressure to these tires or reduce air pressure, you make that tire, by putting more air pressure in it, you make the tire stronger, and that changes the chassis. If you take air pressure out of the tire, you make the tire weaker, and therefore making the car a little bit tighter changes the chassis as well. Dale Earnhardt Jr. continues to parade around in front of the field. Kevin Harvick, Mike Skinner run right behind him. We're at 39 laps in, pit stops coming up shortly. We were talking about loose just a moment ago. Let me show you what we're talking about. The car enters the corner. You turn the steering wheel back on the throttle. There's where you want to be in the green spot. But the back end, it gets loose, goes up the racetrack, and I save that, baby. That's like that, Wally. Danny, that was a great save. A little, little exaggerated on the loose there. A little exaggerated, but car was that loose you're gonna be on pit road now i think bill Elliott's car may be that loose yeah mike skinner going for third inside of mike wallace skinner in the 31 wallace in the seven that's matt kenzen right in the top side right behind him i talked to mike after practice and and uh after i said man it was the beginning of practice last practice last night was your car that loose he said yeah it was they made some adjustments right there before the end of practice and he was really happy with the car he's in the wrong line right now though there is no line there. And not a choice of his own. Got to have somebody behind you helping you push through the air. Or you're going to lose a lot of positions. Skinner was racing for third a minute ago. He finally has some help. Someone pulls up behind him. That's Kenny Schrader in the 36 car. He's racing for eighth now, Skinner is. Schrader, he started back in 39th position. Pound for second. Oh, oh. Man, that is, that's threatening it right there, buddy. Mike Wallace squeezing in front of Harvick. Now jumping in line behind Kenseth and in front of Kurt Busch. Harvick now is in the wrong spot on the racetrack. Mark Martin going by. Onboard camera with Mark. This is one of his better runs at Daytona in a good while. Three wide in front of him. You know, Mark's one of those guys, when I run here, it seems like I always try to run with the guys I'm comfortable with running, that you know you can just get on their bumper and they're going to take you to the front. And I always look for guys like Mark, Ricky Rudd, Sterling. These guys are the guys you can count on when you come to strict plate races. Terry Lobani, another one. You know you can really trust these guys on getting you through the field. It's Jeff Gordon on the outside of that three wide. This is not where you want to be where the seven car is if you're loose right now. You're in the middle and you had Skinner right on your tail. And boy, it is tough getting through the corners if you're loose like that because you've got nowhere to go. Now we're at lap 45. They'll, they'll complete 46 when they come around next time. About lap 50 with no caution flag between here and there. We'll start to see drivers dropping onto pit road for important green flag stops. An update on Dale Earnhardt Jr., the leader's strategy at this point from Marty. Well, again, Alan, they do not have as good a fuel mileage as most other teams do, so they will pit on lap 50, along with Bobby Hamilton and Joe Nemechek. That has been worked out, although Hamilton's at the back of the pack. They do need a drafting partner, so they are going to come a little bit early. Junior's biggest problem right now is that when he goes full throttle, he starts to pull away from everybody. And we heard Matt Yoakum earlier say that when you pull away from everybody, that allows them to get a run on you. So Junior's not even full throttle right now when he's leading the pack. Back up to Sarah's to Allen. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads the Pepsi 400. Matt Kenseth, Todd Bodine, Mark Martin, and John Andretti. Also up in that fight for the top spot, pit stops when we come back. We're already past the one-quarter point of the Pepsi 400 with 49 laps 
out of 160 and getting ready for a round of pit stops. Yeah, right now I'm, I'm, I'm listening to my crew saying, okay, we're going to pit in four, pit in five. My chief mechanic is talking to the spotter. Hey, ask so-and-so when he's coming because we all want to come in together, at least with the group you're running with. Those are the spotters up on the roof watching their car and trying to help their driver with trouble ahead of him on the racetrack. And, and assorted other functions. And assorted other functions, as a matter of fact, trying to keep them out of trouble, letting them know when they can come off their corner and drift back up into the crew. Here's Here the leader, Junior. Dale Earnhardt Jr. ducks for pit road. The stop will come at lap 50. Wow. Somebody's way hard on the brakes coming in there. Brett, uh, Jeff Purvis yep. was the one who lit up the brakes. He will need new tires after that. Marty Snyder will cover Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s pit stop for us. And Dale Jr. comes down pit road. He is one of only three drivers to finish top 10 in both of the restrictor plate races so far this year. He says the car is just a hair tight. He originally wanted no adjustments, but then he called for a last second adjustment, quarter pound out of the right rear. That's a very small adjustment. He wants to be a little looser off the turns. Dale Jr. back out on the track. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Big Ed Watkins, the jack man for KCI. What drops the jack, he's down and away, air pressure. He was very loose. His teammate, Bill Elliott's also in. He's also complaining about a loose condition, as is the Dodge in the 92 of Stacey Compton. Compton very slow coming to pit road. He was well off the gas in turn three, so perhaps a further problem there. Here's Johnny Benson on the pit lane. Jeremy Mayfield's in. Rick Mast is in. Ken Schrader's been in. I'll tell you what, and these guys that strategy-wise were in the back, Benny, I think that's going to hurt them because they're going to come out and they're going to lose that lead draft. Bill Weber. Stacey Compton on pit road. His car's been all over the track, loose and tight. They had to get an adjustment to try and fix the handle, but the biggest thing here is that he ran out of fuel on the track. Now he's sitting here. They're going to have to push him to get him started. Compton out of fuel on pit road. Another whole charge coming off of turn four, down toward the pit lane. Compton gets it running. The, what they were squirting in the air cleaner, in the air intake, was ether. Something that's kind of like gas. They're spraying in there in aerosol form. They can spray in there. Dave Burns. Mike Wallace is in now. They don't make any chassis oh. adjustments, just four tires and fuel for Wallace. He said the car is pretty good. The only thing they've told him is to keep the radiator fan on when you're behind other cars. They're going to pull a tearaway off the windshield, and Wallace is out of here. Let's go to Ben. Ricky Rudd getting four tires and fuel originally wanted to pit with the 29, but couldn't do that because the 29 was ahead of them on the track behind them on pit road. They would have had to work their way around them. Ricky Craven had trouble getting to his pit stall. He overshot it. Yep. Big time. And here comes all the other. Oh, top of that. Almost ran in the back of the 17 of Matt Kenseth. Kurt Busch, Mike Skinner, Mark Martin, Kevin Harvick, Sterling Marlin, Jeff Burton, Dale Jarrett is in, Ward Burton's in, and the Gibbs cars, Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart. We go to Matt Yoakum. Mark Martin already comes to a stop in his pit box. He was complaining of a tight condition. They made an air pressure adjustment in the right front, an air pressure adjustment in the right rear. Front tire changer Robert Benfield has kidney stones. He's okay, but they've got Todd Ziegler standing by. The left side's come out. Let's go to Bill Weber. Four tires and fuel Kevin Harvick's first pit stop in a Winston Cup car in a race at Daytona. Watch for the traffic to close quickly on the outside. Those are the cars that fitted a lap ago or two laps ago. Looks like Ricky Rudd's going to come out with the lead. Harvick still trying to get his car up to speed. Check that. It looks like Steve Park will get away from pit road first. Well, now let's just find out. They're all still trying to get up to speed. <laughs> I think they make Matt Kenseth might be the leader of this little event. There we go. Kenseth leads, Kurt Busch second, Todd Bodine third, Mike Skinner fourth, Dale Earnhardt Jr. fifth, then Rudd, Park, Rusty Wallace, Ken Schrader, and Jeff Gordon, your top ten. 
And look at Junior go by Kenton. What in the world was that all about? And Kenton was leading the last time by, so something is wrong with the 17 car. Line. Rusty Wallace behind Kenseth. Puts Kurt Busch in the lead, but maybe not Master. for long. Todd Bodine up and around. Boy, they all ganged up on the rookie, didn't they? So green flag pit stops have been completed. And Todd Bodine is now the leader of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. NBC's coverage of the Pepsi 400 is brought to you by 1-800-CALL-ATT for collect calls. By the Wide Track Grand Prix from Pontiac, wider is better. By Original Coors, nothing beats an original. And by UPS, the official delivery company of NASCAR. New leader in the Pepsi 400, Dale Earnhardt Jr. has re-established himself out in front. It's Mike Skinner second, Ricky Rudd third, Steve Park fourth. And now Todd Bodine tries to take fifth away from Kurt Busch. Here's our course pit summary. Well, Earnhardt Jr. didn't come out of the pits first, but he now is first. He came out and uh, passed, quickly passed some cars. Kenseth was the leader off the pit stop, but he's been very rapidly shuffled back tonight. We'll try and get a report from Pit Road on what happened to him there. You see Kevin Harvick dropped to 16th. We watched him have a lot of trouble getting up to full speed. Yeah, that, that's tough here. It's tough that, you know, when you come in for a pit stop, it's tough not to spin your tires and, and get a good run off a of pit lane. Kurt Busch, rookie from Las Vegas in the 97 car, one of Jack Roush's entries in the race. Skinner's looking for the lead if he can get some help. And it looks like that Ricky Rudd is going to give him some help. But he can't go by. Look how, how strong that A car is tonight. He pulled out with help and didn't go by. But, you know, we saw Sterno like that earlier. But, uh... See if those adjustments help. Right now, our pole setter Sterling Mall is back in 24th position, but he's only 1.8 seconds behind the leader. We talked about Ricky Craven overshooting his pit when he came onto pit road a moment ago. Let's go back and take a look. That's Craven in the orange 32 car. Well, he had a little help by the looks of it. He's already passed it, though. The 33 car. 33 car got in the back of it. And, I'm, and now, and basically, unless they get a yellow, that, that whole deal right there, you completely lost the draft, and now all you're hoping is that you'll get a caution so you can catch back up. We have been caution free so far. We're at 60 laps complete, that's 150 miles. Rusty Wallace racing Kurt Busch, that'll be for fifth spot. Wallace in the two. Check some speeds at the line, see who's fastest at the moment. They're all about the same speed, but Earnhardt Jr. was, in fact, the quickest. It's kind of unusual here at Daytona in the draft for the guy out in front of the draft to be the fastest. I know that sounds awkward, but it is unusual. Usually the guys getting the toe from that car breaking the air will be a little bit faster. Let's go to pit road. 
just update you guys on the 17 car. No problems for them, BP. In fact, their pit stop was so good, they pulled off a pit road so fast. By the time they got their speed built up, Matt looked in his rearview mirror, and the whole field was building up speed behind him. He didn't have a drafting partner when he got out there, and he got great trade. The car is very good. It was a little loose. They made an air pressure adjustment. Robbie Reiser says his car and his driver are both strong. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. I was really concerned that something was wrong, but that's what we talked about. The spotters tell these drivers when they get a big lead to paddle, to back off a little bit and let that second place car catch them. Don't let them get a run on you. Of the 43 who started the race, 42 are on the lead lap. Stacy Compton running out of fuel, cost him a lap to the race leader. It's Dale Earnhardt Jr. out in front of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads the 43rd running of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. We're 65 laps complete of 160 that make up the distance. So far, 11 lead changes in this race. I think we've clearly established that Dale Earnhardt Jr. has the strongest car. In the beginning, it looked like Sterling Marlin, but it's definitely Dale Jr. at this stage of the race. There's no doubt, unless something happens on the next pit stop to make one of these other cars a lot faster, they're going to have a lot of trouble beating Jr. tonight. But remember, he has got to stop twice. I think, I don't know how much fuel he had left over when he made that pit stop, but 50 and 50 and 50 is one, is 150, he's 10 laps short. What about it, Marty? Well, Benny, you're exactly right. They can go a little bit further, but it's gonna be close. Jeff Clark is the engine tuner for Dale Earnhardt Jr. He went back and calculated. He said on the next stop, they can probably go about 54 laps. That's gonna put them close to the finish, though and all of that discussion if we go to the finish without a caution flag. Well, that's right, and these guys are driving pretty decently tonight, so maybe there will not be a caution flag. But 50 and 54 is 104, <laughs> that leaves 56. We talked earlier, the closer you get to the finish, the higher the probability of somebody making a mistake pressing hard. Well, that's right, we'll see. Drop back in traffic a little bit to Dave Marcus running in 40th position, the 71 car, 60 years old, originally from Wisconsin. David making tonight his 880th NASCAR Winston Cup start, second all time only to Richard Petty. Dave is one of the icons of the sport. He is the blue collar racer. He owns his own team. He works on his own cars. You call his race shop, he'll answer the phone. And if he doesn't answer the phone, they'll have to go get him out from one of the race cars to come talk to you. He pays all the bills. He wears wingtip shoes when he drives. And the reason we bring this up is, first of all, because he's a terrific story that he made the race. Second of all, he's getting ready to close his NASCAR Winston Cup career. He'll run five more events after tonight this year, then attempt to qualify for the Daytona 500 in February, and then call it a career, a good and long career. And then look for a young man to jump in that car and become his driver. He wants to continue his racing team. It's Bob Marcus. Screw chief. Small operation, fraction of the funding, fraction of the people that these other teams operate with. But you know one thing about Dave Marcus, he will always brace you as hard as he can. On board, Dale Jarrett running in 12th. Hey, what, Kurt Busch was doing some rim riding around that corner in three and four, right up against that outside retaining wall. Kurt Busch, the 22-year-old from Las Vegas, Nevada. It is 24th Winston Cup Series race and his second ever here at Daytona. And normally, you're up there because you're loose. You're using all the racetrack to keep that car from the rear end from jumping out on you. So normally guys running up there like that, just trying to save it every lap. There's Jeff Gordon running behind Michael Waltrip. <laughs> I think he chose the wrong line. He chose to try to hook up with Michael Waltrip in the 15 car and work their way to the front, but it's like he might be losing some spots. Let's go to Matt Yoakum. Benny, the four-time Daytona winner, Jeff Gordon, is currently riding in the eighth position. When he made his pit stop on lap 52, he was complaining his car was loose in and tied off. Three-quarter of a round down on the right rear jack screw, they all, which also takes wedge out and raises the spoiler, which should help this race car. But they are also iffy on fuel, making it on one more stop. Meanwhile, the 22 car aboard Burton has climbed up to the 18th position, but he's still complaining about his car being horribly loose. They made a track bar, a wedge, and air pressure adjustment. 
They were hoping to get a caution to pull a spring rubber. Right now, they're also going to look to the next pit stop to make more adjustments. Alan? Four cars have broken away from the rest of the pack by lining up and just stay in single file while the guys behind ever run in side by side. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Mike Skinner, Ricky Rudd, and Steve Park are those four drivers. We're at lap 71 of 160 that make up the distance tonight, closing in on halfway in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Our Wendy's race menu, it's the race for the championship on NBC and TNT next Sunday, one week from tomorrow. It's the Chicagoland Speedway, brand new track. NASCAR Winston Cup Series at 2 p.m. Eastern on NBC. Couple of weeks down the line, we go to the New Hampshire International Speedway Mile on TNT, 1.30 Eastern, July 22nd. Three weeks, Pocono Raceway in Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania 500. And then a month from now, the Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis. Can't wait. Looking at the leaders working some lap traffic now. As Dale Earnhardt Jr. and his three followers have caught and overtaken Kyle Petty and Bill Elliott. Put them a lap down. And right now, Ricky Craven, the lap car, the tide ride, has put himself between the leader, Jr., and Mike Skinner, the 31, in second spot. But Craven wants to hang there, hopefully wants to try to stay there in case the caution flag comes out, get by the leader, get his lap back. Look like that's going to work. Steve Park got kind of shaken out there when they got into the lap traffic. Lost a little bit of contact with these front three. Skinner second, Rudd third. Craven is back in 38th position. One lap down. I mentioned Elliott and Kyle Petty. Kyle is in 40th. Elliott is in 41st. Rick Mast is going to lap down. He's 42nd. And earlier, Stacy Compton running out of fuel on the pit stop. He's 43rd. Look at this. Oh. That's back for 10th spot on down. Todd Bodine. 24 car of Jeff Gordon. There to see Mark Martin, Matt Kenseth, and Dale Jarrett. Haven't talked much about Dale so far tonight. Second in the NASCAR Winston Cup Championship coming in. We look from Jeff Gordon back to Matt Kenseth. Dale's one of those guys that sneaks up on you, though. You'll never see him, you'll never see him, and then all of a sudden, 10 laps to go, he's there. He's in front of you. Say, so how do you do that? Yeah. More on Dale Jarrett from Bill Weber. Well, they had a strong pit stop, and if you remember, DJ had complained about the water temperature going up. The original plan was to pull tape off the grill to try and get more air in there. They decided not to do that. Dale moved around a little bit on the racetrack, got some air in there. So that's not a problem as of right now. Lead change. Mike Skinner out front. And he did that very conventionally. Here's Ricky Rudd trying to take over that second spot, but it doesn't look like that's going to work. We got the teammates, teammates working up high, so. And look at Junior go by on the outside of Skinner. Is he going to take the lead back? Yes, he is. Wow. All yes. right, we saw Spike Skinner take the lead, but the record book will never show that. Yep. Got a lead at the start-finish line there for it to count. Sorry, Mike. Skinner faced with a, a quandary from the driver's perspective. Ricky Rudd helped push him past Dale Jr. See? into the lead, but Dale Jr. drives a Chevrolet. Ricky Rudd drives a Ford. Skinner has to protect his make, doesn't he? Well, it depends on who your friend's going to be that last lap. If Ricky helped me get up there, I need to help Ricky all night long, so he'll be there for me at the end. You see the air temperature at the start of the race is 85. Has cooled off 4 degrees, and track temperature has only cooled off 3 degrees. Steve Park racing Skinner for second. Let me tell you something, guys. You guys don't forget, and I, as a driver, you don't forget. If if somebody hangs you out to dry, you're gonna. Third, Kevin Harvick in fourth spot. 
see Steve Park and Michael Walter. Michael Wallace is back in the mix in that seven car. We knew who you meant. Yeah, we do. Mike's running a great race tonight. He's been staying up in that lead 10, 12, just about all night long. They've had great pit stops. Good run for Mike. Those seven cars you're looking at all on the lead lap. They've shuffled the cars they overtook back into the traffic. They're fighting for second. Michael Waltrip under Mike Skinner. And now Waltrip's got help. His Dale Earnhardt Incorporated teammate is behind him, Steve Park. <laughs> Mike Skinner's Richard Childress racing teammate, the white car, Kevin Harvick. Bailing out. Going into the other line. Yeah. Oh, well. Going into the other line. Yeah. Meanwhile, look how far the junior has pulled away of these guys battle for second position and that other group that was a second behind them last time by is now on their rear bumper. Now has Dale Jr. got too big a lead when they get lined up oh, they've got trouble here. Andy Houston in the wall cautions out. That's off turn four. Grinding to a stop. Houston led the race earlier. See him moving around in the car, dropping the window net. That's his signal to the safety officials that he's okay. I think you'll see a lot more aggressive changes, Benny, now, now that we're under caution. Every co everybody comes in the same time. We may even see some spring rubbers being put in these cars. And what this also does with the caution at lap 87, it takes the pit deficiency, the fuel mileage deficiency that Dale Earnhardt Jr. had out of the equation for now. If the race runs green from this set of stops, we'll see under the yellow to the finish. Everybody's going to have to stop twice more. So if you're a Dale Jr. fan, this is a, this is a plus for you. This is big. This really is big. Andy Houston, this is the low end of what has been a good week so far for him. That's why Flory gave birth to a new son on Monday of this week. He led the race earlier. Now he ended up in the outside wall. He, he broke something, cut a right front tire, Benny. Yeah, the right front tire went flat on the car for some reason. And when that happens, the car just veers right. And there's nothing the driver can do. But you know one thing, he was very fortunate. He was running close to the yeah, wall. Yeah, I was just going to say that. That's the best place to be if you're going to cut a right front tire. Look at that passenger side window the cars carry here at Daytona. You see that go flying out of the car when he hit the wall? It just popped that right out. He hit so hard. And there's Andy out of the car. I've got a question, Benny. If, if you think if these guys were loose, do you think they perhaps maybe they've increased the right front air pressure? Maybe got too much heat in it? Could very possible done that. Yes. If you add air pressure to the right front tire, that will help the loose situation. We'll see everybody come on to pit road at lap number 89. And this caution flag, probably a big break for some of those drivers that had gotten shaken out of the draft, like, uh, well, Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart. Casey Atwood were pretty well back, but it's a horrible break for Ricky Craven and Bill Elliott and those drivers who got overtaken by the leaders and didn't get a chance to maybe get it back on a cycle of green flag stops. They're, they're trapped a lap down, and it's probably going to be that way the rest of the night. So here we go. Earnhardt Jr., Michael Waltrip, Steve Park, Mike Skinner, Mike Wallace. Will be the top five coming on to pit road. Let's go to Dave Burns. And Ken Schrader will come in. He was running great out there. No changes anticipated other than air pressure for Ken at this point. And Newt Moore has this thing cranked up. They spent time in the wind tunnel earlier this year to try to get this right. Let's go to Bill Weber. Michael Waltrip slips through his pit stall. He has to back up, and now the whole stock will have to start over. It's still supposed to be four tires and loosen them up a little bit with a track bar adjustment. Let's go to Marty. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is in. He clearly had the best car on that run, and he was not happy with it. A little loose off he was. They made a half pound out of the, or into the left rear, and they will win the race off pit road. A rusty wallop. Looked like a dirt truck. Oh, man, oh, man. 31 car had to back up out of his pit, and 15 car just about hit him. Mike Skinner and Michael Walter. Bill Weber. 
Michael Waltrip obviously came down pit road hot. He just said something about his brake pedal on the radio, but what happened is he slid through his stall in the Skinner stall, so when Skinner got here, there was no place for him to go. Then when Michael was ready to leave, he had to pull out around Skinner's car. Skinner's car was ready to leave. He had to pull out around Skinner's car. Skinner's car wasn't in his stall. That made all kinds of traffic. I saw Jeremy Mayfield shoot through the grass. Remember, two and a half miles on the track, but just 15 feet wide, 29 feet long on these pit stalls. When they pit under caution, it's a very hectic place. <laughs> when we were looking at the Michael Waltrip car back on the banking, I thought I saw a huge dent in the left side door. I think that's the American flag, Alan. That's just the paint? Yeah, I think the paint. Yeah. Optical delusion? Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. It looked like he and Skinner made contact right there behind the numbers, Benny, and that may be a dent there. We'll try and get a better look at it when he comes back around. So Dale Earnhardt Jr., first off of the pit lane. And it, it is true. It, these pits, they look, they look like they're big. And when the car's in them, but when you're down there and you've got to get in one of these pits, they are very small. Cars are lap down, heading for pit road for their service now. Let's go back and take another look. See if Skinner doesn't actually get into the door of Michael Waltrip's car. And watch Mayfield have to take to the grass. I don't know if we're going to see it in this. Two cars are starting to leave. <laughs> see, one and the 17 almost ran into each other. Okay, Mike Skinner's going to back up. Michael Waltrip's going to try to leave. Uh, you might have something there, Alan. He may have backed in there a little bit. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Say that again. Uh, you might I'm, have something you there. You may Alan. have something there. Uh, so I'm not. I'm not going to 100 percent. First time I've heard you say that. I just wanted <laughs> to make sure I got it right. 90 laps complete in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. The restart when we come back. Welcome back to Daytona under caution in the 43rd running of the Pepsi 400. Moments ago, virtually the entire field on pit road, and watch what happened to the 15 car of Michael Waltrip coming down pit road. He slid through his stall, had to put it reverse and back up. Now, because he had slid through his stall, Skinner, the car in front of him, was actually over the line, but that's legal because it was a forced move. So now, when they finally get the 15 car ready to go, Michael has nowhere to go because while you can't see it right here, he's got to swing all the way around there, Skinner, and then you see the traffic coming by, Skinner trying to get out, Jeremy Mayfield goes through the grass. Wow. Wally? I'm glad I didn't get... completely commit myself, <laughs> Alan, <laughs> on right. that one. Let me have it. Woo. Go ahead. That was close. Alan, we're trained professionals. Just remember that. <laughs> How am I going to live with you two for the next 19 weeks? All right, well, getting ready to go back racing. Dale Earnhardt Jr. holding the lead through the pit stops. Steve Park is second, Matt Kenseth third, Ken Schrader fourth. Everybody's on fresh tires. It's going to get real busy on the backstretch, I believe, on this restart. Four wide, three or four wide. This is, might be where we see someone go beneath that yellow line. Yeah. Oh, that's a no-no. Out of bounds. NASCAR said in the pre-race drivers meeting, go under the yellow line to improve your position. Because here's what's going to happen. These guys in the back, say 12, 15 back, I think they're going to duck down, try to get a run on the lap down cars, and split them. That's what I do. All right. Green flag is out. We'll find out. But you can't pass on the inside until you get to the start finish line. So all these cars have to go by on the outside. Now, as they go down in one, you can pass if you, you're able to. Go get them. There's a big gap there from about 15 back on that restart. Somebody got a it's, bad restart there. It's Bill Elliott and Stacy Compton trying to get a lap back from the leader. Elliott and the red Dodge on the inside. Doesn't look like that's going to work tonight. Uh, <laughs> the way Dale Jr.'s running. No. <laughs> and because somebody missed a shift or something in the middle of that pack, that took away your, your big charge? I think so. Sterling dropped back about six or seven car lengths there. Somebody bottomed out really bad up there. Big shell response. Mountain Dew pit summary. Look at Matt Kendall. Once again, a great pit stop by Robbie Rouser in that 
DeWalt team, eighth, comes out third. Schroeder picks up a couple, and Harvey picks up a couple. Only caution of the race brought out when Andy Houston hit the wall in turn four a short while ago. Let's hear from him. Alan, new father, Andy Houston, has just called new mama, Lori, to tell her that uh, he's okay. Andy, uh, what did happen out there? Uh, cut a right front tire down uh, on McDonald's Ford. We, uh, we had a really good race car. We ran up front early. It seemed like uh, the longer we ran, the tighter the car got. Uh, first pit stop, made adjustments, tried to free the car up, and uh, didn't nearly go far enough. The car uh, really pushed that second that second run after the first stop, and uh, finally ended up blowing the right front tire out and uh, hitting the wall pretty hard. But uh, I'm okay. Just another bad weekend for the McDonald's Ford, and uh, you know, we just can't seem to get this thing turned around. Hopefully, uh, we'll go to Chicago next week. That's home of McDonald's headquarters, and uh, try to have a good run up there. It's uh, pretty frustrating right now, but uh, you know, we're gonna this is the best shot they've had. It was Andy's best career qualifying performance so far in Winston Cup. And Alan, the, apparently Andy also reports he may stick around. Joe Nemechek is not feeling well, and Andy may substitute for him if, there, if the need arises. But Joe Nemechek is making his first start in some six races. He had a hard testing crash at Dover, which he broke his elbow and had assorted other injuries. This is his first race back, so maybe uh, those injuries still feeling the after effects of. Look at the race for second here. Matt Kenseth and Steve Park. Kenseth in the 17. Park in the 1. Got Ken Schrader behind Kenseth. 31 car went from and 23rd. For the lead, Kenseth outside of Dale Earnhardt Jr. Side by side. Now we'll see how strong Junior's car is. Yes, and look at all these cars behind them just clawing for position. We see Schrader literally pushing Kenseth down the straightaway, trying to bump him in front of the eight car. Opening laps of the race, Sterling Marlin had the strongest car, dropped back into the field till he could get a couple of pit stops for the crew to adjust the car. He's sneaking back up. He's in ninth spot, while Kenseth and Junior come to the stripe, still going at it for the lead. Kenseth in 17. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and eight. They raced together in the NASCAR Bush Series for a couple of years. Became pretty good friends, but not friends enough to give the other one a victory. 170,000 seats at Daytona. They're all empty. Everybody's on their feet. Mike Wallace. Wallace, be careful that yellow line down there. Oh, and he goes by big brother Rusty. Boy, you know that did his heart good. <laughs> Kenseth could not make the pass happen. Speeds at the line. Now, that's more like it. The car's back in the draft, getting towed along a little bit faster. That's what we expect to see. 63 laps to go in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt Jr. for now has fended off another challenge to take away the number one spot. NBC's coverage of the Pepsi 400 is brought to you by Dodge and the nearly 3,000 dealers who invite you to come see what's new. By Miller Lite. Grab a Miller Lite. It's Miller time. By Pep Boys. All you need to know is where to go. Pep Boys and by Pfizer, where life is our life's work. 250 miles will be complete as they cross the start-finish line this time in the 43rd Pepsi 400. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the leader. He has fended off about all challengers to his top spot, and there have been a few for a little while now. Earnhardt Jr. went to the front for the first time in lap number 27. There wasn't room there, kids. There was not room to go on the outside, but somehow he did it. He did it because Dale Jr. gave him the room. Man, oh man, there couldn't have been just inches on either side. Bill Weber has more on Matt Kenseth. Well, I guess they are good friends, huh, Benny? After a move like that? Oh, man, oh man, Bill. Now, remember, early in the race, Matt was loose. So on the first pit stop, they tightened him up, made him way too tight. So on the most recent pit stop, they made other changes. 
a half pound in the right rear, half pound out of the right front, a half turn out of the left rear. They made those changes. This car is good now, but it's better on long runs. Remember, Robbie Reiser said, my car and my driver are strong. Marty? And Bill, actually, what happened there is Dell Jr. was trying to protect the high line. A couple of minutes ago, he talked to his spotter, Ty Norris. Jr.'s car can run anywhere. He said, where does Steve want to run? Meaning his teammate, Steve Park. Ty Norris said he needs to run high. He said, OK, I'll run high. He was trying to protect that high line and keep his teammate behind him. And wow, what a strong car he's got. He muscled his way back up to the front. Now he has a lead once again. So problem is Steve Park's in the low line. And Earnhardt Jr. now has moved down to try to bring the 31, the Chevrolet of Skinner and Steve Park. Almost some contact there between Rusty and the 29, huh, Wally? Yeah, that was awfully close. Look at Jr. pull down and pull that bottom line with him. Jr.'s car is really fast in the corner. I mean, it basically stay the same in the straightaway, but if you watch his car in a corner, he actually leaves the car behind him when they go through the corners. Here's our Dodge race fact. Four times in this July Classic at Daytona, the Pepsi 400 has been won by a Dodge. 1977 was the last one. The King, Richard Petty, was behind the wheel of that car. We have a second retiree from the race. Jeff Purvis has taken his car to the garage. Some smoke trailing from behind it on that last set of pit stops. It has now been officially put out of this Pepsi 400. Three Chevrolets, two Fords in the top five. Dale Earnhardt Jr. continues to show the way in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona on NBC. The 43rd running of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona comes your way live with 106 of 160 laps complete. And Dale Earnhardt Jr., the dominant driver thus far. Here's our Napa Field summary. Sterling Marlin dominant early, then Dale Earnhardt Jr. dominant since. Only one caution flag. That when Andy Houston hit the wall back at lap number 88. Houston and Jeff Purvis, the two drivers out of the race. Steve Park was third last lap. And he was desperately trying to get in the same line as the eight car and got shuffled out and dropped back to 16th. In one lap. In one lap. And I blinked and I missed that. And you're the driver behind the wheel and you're trying not to rip the steering wheel right <laughs> out of the car, right? This that's the frustration part I talked about during yeah. the telecast. 35 cars on the lead lap now. The only cars that are not on the lead lap are Ricky Craven, Dave Marcus, Stacy Compton, Bill Elliott, Kyle Petty, and Rick Mass. They all fell way behind on a set of green flag pit stops where they lost the draft, and then the leaders overtook them, and then the caution came out. Everybody else besides those drivers and Purvis and Houston, who are out of the race, still in the hunt, basically. Mike Skinner is really giving that 31 car a great run tonight as well. We just saw in the graphic that after that botched pit stop that he had fallen back to 22nd position and right now is battling for the second spot with Rusty Wallace. Now Rusty showed a little muscle for the first time tonight. Bill Weber has more on Rusty Wallace. Alan, two things everybody needs to know about Rusty Wallace. How hard that team worked to get this car ready for Daytona and how much Rusty wants this win. He's never won a restrictor plate race, was third in the Daytona 500. Crew Chief Robin Pemberton spent the time and money to win tunnel this car that we showed you in the pre-race show. Right now, Rusty is desperate to get to the front. He wanted to be able to run up high on the racetrack, so they made that change last time. But the track keeps changing. First, it's up high, then it's down low. Robin said, really, it's just like I told you after practice. There's no one guy out there yet, except uh, Dale Jr. What's that about the third or fourth guy, Mike Skinner, that's gone up to try and take the lead away from Dale Jr.? And each time, he seems to find a way to keep it out front. He's making all the right moves. He is inspired. Yes, he is. It looks like Rusty Wallace is going to get by Skinner to take over that second position.
Mike Skinner's team asking NASCAR if he actually led that last lap to get five bonus points in the championship. Answer came back negative. I checked the monitor when they went by. It was a very, very close finish to the line, and the monitor said that Dale Jr. had led that lap. Three deep. Yep. That's Mike's Ken Schrader up the outside. There's Jeff Gordon down on the inside. I don't know if Mike can't run up high or, or what the deal was to lead that open. He's going to lose a lot of spots now, him and the 29 car. But maybe he can't run up that high. Watch that yellow line, Jeremy Mayfield. He thought about it. The 12 car started to look low. It's going to be real tempting the last five laps. Skinner finally got back in line. Here comes Rusty Wallace. Oh, he opens up the outside a little bit, and Schrader just drives up on the outside. Along with Matt Kenseth. Junior goes up to block that. That Junior can just come from the bottom to the top. He handles any place on, in the corner. He's having to work real hard to figure out which line to stay in now. Dale Junior is. He's looking in his rear as much as he's looking out of the windshield. Here's a Craftsman Truck Series update. This was earlier today at the new Kansas Speedway. How about Ricky Hendricks, son of the Winston Cup champion many times now. Team owner Rick Hendrick got his first win in the Truck Series. Congratulations, Ricky. I know your dad and your grandpa is just as thrilled as they can be. And how about John Wood in four spot? That's Eddie Wood's son. Next, he's 20 years old. Yeah, next generation of the Wood Brothers coming along. This one behind the wheel. Rusty Wallace running second. Richard Childress racing teammates there. Skinner in the 31, Harvick in the 29. And Mark Martin starting to move back into the picture. Dale Earnhardt Jr. continues to run out in front of the Pepsi 400. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. The Pepsi 400 from Daytona International Speedway. Under green at lap 116 of 160. It has been Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s night so far. Here's our Home Depot track fact. The lighting system installed here at Daytona 1998. Enough to illuminate a two-lane street from Daytona Beach to Muscatine, Iowa. Here's your... Here's your knowledge tester Benny Muscatine Iowa significant in that trivia fact for what it's the name it's the hometown of the company that installed the lighting system Musco there you go very good that was too easy I knew I wouldn't catch you out on that one look at this look on the inside oh he almost get ran, ran down the yellow line Sterling Marlin the pole center net dodge trying to work his way back to the front last time by was in about the seventh position Sterling led two times for 20 laps early in the event, then dropped way back in the field with an ill-handling car. But somebody was smoking off that second corner. It's Joe Nemechek's car. NASCAR spotters are reporting, Benny. There it is. And there it is. That's too bad. I see he's hit the wall. Well, that'll yeah. do it. Yes. That was tire smoke we were seeing. Yeah, right back here you see the bumper. The rear part of the bumper's hanging out. Right there. <laughs> I tried. You were one of those kids that couldn't come up. Oh, I was lines, terrible. Huh? I was terrible. Yeah. I'd come in and give it to Andy now. I think I would too. Go ahead, Andy. Take her out. Andy Houston is standing by because Joe Nemechek was not feeling well. He's feeling worse now. Back yeah, to the lead. And you hope that, that his aches and pains didn't contribute to getting into the wall or getting into the wall didn't make it worse. And as we watch this, Nemechek will bring his car to pit road. Mike Skinner hung out again. <laughs> A lot 
lot of rumors around Skinner concerning his future in this 31 car that maybe Richard Childress might be considering a change. Nothing confirmed there, but certainly external pressure on Skinner with all the speculation around to have some good performances. Let's get an update on Joe Nemechek from Dave Burns. Well, Alan, they didn't do much. They put on two right side tires and told him not to speed and didn't lift the hood, didn't do anything else. In fact, I'm going to go take a look. Uh, there is fluid down there. Can't quite tell what. It yeah, they, um, that's what it is, guys. We'll check on it, see if there's anything really wrong with the car. They know they can make it to the end now on fuel, though. This pack is going to overtake him off of turn two and onto the backstretch. Well, he, he might be able to blend in. I don't think so. No. First instinct was right. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has spent most of the time in this race since lap 27 in the lead. We're now at lap 120, 300 miles into the Pepsi 400. It's Earnhardt Jr., Rusty Wallace, Michael Waltrip, Kevin Harvick, and Ken Schrader, the top five. Our Pepsi race recap. We went green in the Pepsi 400 in Daytona just after 8 p.m. Eastern time with Sterling Marlin leading the field of 43 to the green. The fans salute the memory of Dale Earnhardt at lap three. His son, Dale Earnhardt Jr., pushing Kevin Harvick toward the front of the pack and then taking the lead away from Harvick at lap number 27. Junior's team, as well as Harvick's, planning their green flag pit stop strategy. They came in together. This was lap 88, the only caution of the race. Cut right front tire, sent Andy Houston into the turn four wall. He was okay. He's one of only two drivers out of the race. Jeff Purvis also is retired with engine failure. We're just past 300 miles now. And closing in on another set of pit stops coming up in another 12, 15 laps or so. This is back for ninth, 10th, 8th, ninth, and 10th. Oh, man, they are ganged up three abreast. Come on now, guys. Easy, easy. Play nice. If it looks tight from here, it's really tight looking from down there. Burton's car, the gold Dodge there. See that thing just start pushing up off turn two. He had to get out of the gas and slide in behind Schrader. Yes, I did. And the other car's going by him on the outside because he had to crack the throttle. And Ward Burton's heart, the 22 driver, has started beating again. I told it that Joe Nemechek made contact with Dave Marcus on the racetrack, the 71, did not hit the wall, but the damage we saw to the right side was from contact with Dave Marcus. Nemechek in 35th position, the first car one lap down. And in fact, just overtaken by Ricky Craven to put him back to 36th. <laughs> Look at Todd Bodine. One of their angels fear to tread. <laughs> Earnhardt Jr., Sterling Marlin, Matt Kenseth, Kevin Harvick, Todd Bodine, Ward Burton, Michael Waltrip, and Robert Presley. All led laps in this race. Presley by staying on the racetrack, but everybody else pitted under the caution. Back at lap number 89, he came in a lap later, but did collect five bonus points. If you lead a lap in a Winston Cup race, you collect five extra championship points. Lead the most laps, you get another five bonus points. It's amazing what's going on behind Dale Earnhardt Jr. I looked just a moment ago, and Jeff Gordon was running in 12th spot, and there he is trying to take the third spot away from Michael Walters with help from Kurt Busch. I'll probably look in a few minutes to be back at 15th. It's just back and forth. But one thing is constant, that white number eight car, the baseball car in front. Yep, nobody's been able to do anything with them, even if they gang up on them. Michael Waltrip, after the problems on the pit stop earlier at lap 89, when he slid through his pits, regaining those lost positions. Taking third. Well, the leader should be coming onto pit road sometime soon. Marty Snyder, let's, let's hear from you about it. Yeah, Alan, about lap 142 or 143, which is not too long from now, we will see the leader, Dale Earnhardt Jr., on pit road. He's fighting two problems right now. One, he wants to make sure he stays out front. And two, 
don't get too big of a lead. He is still about three-quarter throttle. He can pull away from these guys if he wants to. They plan no adjustments on the next stop. He wants to stay out front. To Bill Weber. Could Michael Waltrip be writing another Daytona miracle story? The Daytona 500 winner coming in here looking for the Daytona sweep, putting the 500 and the 400. Had a good car, came down a pit road, as Alan talked about, slid through his pit, lost all those positions, almost hit Skinner on the way out, fell way back in the field, then charged back to the front. The big critical questions when they pit, who will they have as a partner, and how many guys are going to take how many tires if they take any? Down to Dave. Bill, I've been keeping my eye on Mike Wallace all night, and my note sheet says the same thing all the way down. It's okay, it's fine, it's great. Mike Wallace hasn't had any changes, and Jim Long, the crew chief, tells me that he can drive the car anywhere on the track that he wants to. It's now up to him to find a way near the end of the race to be out front at just the right time. Mike Wallace is having a great run. Matt Yoakum. Dave, Jeff Gordon has climbed to the fourth position on his last pit stop. The only adjustments they made were the driver. They handed a water bottle and two ice packs. He was a little bit warm, but no adjustments on the 24 cars. The car is still a little loose on entry, but he is adjusting with his driving. And keep in mind, this car is very stout. This 24 machine is the last non-rad associated team to go to victory lane in a restricted play race. To Bill. Brad being a aerodynamic group, an association between Richard Childress Racing, Andy Petrie Racing, and Dale Earnhardt Incorporated Racing, where they all pool resources with an aerodynamicist to study and improve their cars, particularly for these races here at Daytona and at its sister track, Talladega. Look out, Michael Waltrip and Mike Wallace. And here's Ward Burton back in the mix. We saw Sterling Marlin in the Dodge up there just a moment ago. Here comes the other one. Ward Burton has moved in. Looks like the fifth spot. Ward started in second, fell way back in the field. He's picking his way back into the top five as we close in on pit stops and the finish of the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has dominated so far. Can he hang on to what would be an extremely emotional win? NASCAR on NBC looking down on the Daytona International Speedway for the Pepsi 400 getting down to its final laps tomorrow night at 7 6 central don't miss it all new Dateline NBC street racing it's fast and furious but it's also an illegal sport that can kill it's tomorrow night at 7 6 central Dateline NBC 26 laps to go in the Pepsi 400 and about six to nine laps from the final round of pit stops for the leaders, which will happen under green if we don't see the yellow between now and then. Four, four or two tires. I, I, that, you know, that's a question right now. I would think if the, the front group comes in and takes four tires, I'd have to take two tires if I came in the next lap. But you've run a full fuel load. You can change the tires as fast as you can fill the tank with fuel. I guess it just depends how much fuel you need to put in. Exactly. You don't need a full fuel load to go the distance. So uh, it could be some strategies playing off here. Yeah. And we've seen these cars tonight run faster. As they burn off fuel, they get faster and faster. Look at Jeff Gordon trying to get up to the outside of Michael Waltrip. His drafting partners left him. And there's Ward Burton moving into the fourth spot. Everybody bailed out to the inside line. Gordon's going to go all the way back behind Skinner. He's going to drop to seventh. Ricky Craven on and off pit road. Craven a lap down already. Now a constant theme throughout the night has been Joe Gibbs Racing's two entries being at the back of the field. Bobby Labonte and Tony Stewart dropped to the tail end of the line pretty quickly at the green flag, and they've run there all night. This is Labonte in 30th spot. But you know, he's only four and a half seconds behind the leader. And if they really have a good race car after that final pit stop, then's when he's going to try to start gaining those positions. Tony Stewart, his teammate, is in 26th position. Marty Snyder can tell us more about the Joe Gibbs teammates. 
And guys, Tony Stewart and Bobby Labonte have a radio channel where they can talk to each other. And about 15 laps ago, Tony clicked over to that channel and said, Bobby, let's go to the front. Bobby told Jimmy Nacar, his crew chief, it's time to see what we can do. They've been laying back about half throttle at the back of the pack all night long. Since that time, Tony Stewart has picked up nine spots. Bobby Labonte has picked up six. And as far as the last pit stop goes, guys, some teams are considering fuel only down here and no tires. Riding along in Tony Stewart's car, let's listen to how he's using his throttle in the corner and then compare that to the leader, Dale Earnhardt Jr. He squeezed off the throttle just a little bit as he entered turn three. He's now back wide open again. Sound like he's lifting to me. Sure doesn't. We can't tell. He may be running seven eighths throttle or three quarters throttle. We can't tell that. But now some of these guys, Marty Schneider talked about, is that Jeff Gordon in the fence or just way, way high? He's fallen back. He's back to 14th position. And he's gotten himself down to the inside line. Is he coming to pit road? He may just be getting himself clear of traffic to make his pit stop. Bill Elliott. Casey Atwood and Stacy Compton are all on pit road for stops. But now Marty Schneider talked about some of these guys fuel only. And Wally, we've seen cars make these pit stops, slam on the brakes and slide these tires. Here comes Tony Stewart. Here comes Bobby Labonte on the pit road. You cannot slide these tires if it's going to be fuel only. You cannot flat spot, flat spot these tires. That's right. And, and what, Benny, what, what you're talking about is when you when you lock up the brakes, it just takes that rubber off that tire where the tires are locked up. And then they're at around and it just vibrates and you have to come in and change them. Marty Snyder. Tony Stewart and Bobby Labonte are in. They obviously can make it the rest of the way from here. They're going to take at least two tires. Both of the cars will take two tires and no adjustments for either race car. Pluses and minuses of two tires. Well, it, it takes less time. That's the plus and minus. I talked a moment ago. They're five seconds behind. Two tires. If Earnhardt Jr. changes four, that puts him right with him because they don't need a full load of fuel. Just one can. But the minus is handling adhesion. Yes. Yeah, the guys with four tires, when they catch them, they're going to go right by. Kevin LePage, Ken Schrader, Jeremy Mayfield are on pit road as the leaders come down the back stretch. We'll see who pits this time around. Among this group. I think Schrader was gas only. Ah, uh, they're taking tires back over the wall. We'll check on that. Two tires. Leaders off turn four. Who's bailing out? Johnny Benson is. A couple of cars in the middle of the pack. All the front runners stay out. Dave Blaney's the other one headed to pit road. There's Benson. Blaney right behind him. Blaney just got on the brakes hard. Bunch of smoke comes out, so I'll be interested to see what they change. 19 laps to go. These pit stops could be everything in determining who wins this race. Two tires. Yep. Now that the first couple have done two, isn't the pressure on the rest of these teams to just get two? Yes, it really is. Unless you're deep in the field. Here come a large oh, pack Brad. of front runners. Trouble off the corner. 31. Several cars involved. Three, four, five, six, seven. Sterling Marlin, Mike Skinner, Jeff Gordon's in it, Bobby Hamilton, Kurt Busch is in the crash. Dale Jarrett takes to the pit road. Terry Labonte's involved. Caution's out. I didn't see it, but it looked like some guys were trying to get in the pits and it just stacked up. See some damage to the right front of Kevin Harvick's car. Not a lot of damage, but damage. Oh, a lot of damage to that automobile. Ran so well earlier in the night. There's Skinner. Up Mike, against the fence. Mike's moving around. Looks like he's okay. Jeff Gordon and Kevin Harvick took their cars straight to pit road. 
But it all happened behind Dale Earnhardt Jr. There's Bobby Hamilton trying to push his car back. Backwards down pit road. That car will go behind the wall. <laughs> we talked about the big wreck. This one happened in a way we didn't expect. A lot of damage to Terry Labonte's car. All right, let's see if we can sort this one out. All right, here they're coming off the corner. And I think there's going to be contact right there. Skinner and Kurt Busch get together. Turn Skinner into the wall head on. Labonte has no place to go. Neither does Bobby Hamilton when, straight, when Skinner comes back across the racetrack. Now there's no place for anybody to go. Ooh, oh, who was that who that was just stuck by? Nemechek. Nemechek, yeah. And, and Dave John Marcus, Andretti. Dave Marcus gets down on the grass and somehow saves it. He's almost as good as you. I know. <laughs> and you know what? The seven car was slowing down, coming in the pits. 31 checked up, 97 ran into him. Yep. Shot right across in front of Terry Labonte. Watch the back of this. Dale Jarrett, top right of your screen, going to come through the smoke, head for pit road. Look, a lot of wrecking going on there, Dale. I'd be careful on pit road if I were you. The racetrack looked to be the safest place. You ever see Kurt Busch right on the back bumper, and Mike Wallace goes toward pit road. There's the contact. Skinner gets turned. And man, Terry Labonte says, oh, no. Is that Mark Martin piling in there? Mark has continued driving around. But his chance at that million dollar bonus appears to have taken a, a little bit of a hit there if the damage is significant on his car. Was that Mark's car? Another shot. Get a better look at it here. And it just doesn't take much. I mean, you know, Mike saw the seven car coming in the pits. He rolled out the throttle a little bit. Bush couldn't see what was going on. It just doesn't take much. There we saw the contact with Jeff Gordon. Listen to this, folks. Oh, man. There's nothing you can do on that. All those guys behind had nowhere to go. They're up there minding their own business. And Sterling Marlin. That hurts. No. That's going to leave a mark. Oh, man, I, just, I felt that. Did you feel that? I did feel that. Oh. That's because you hit me when it happened. Ricky Rudd's lucky man. Jeff Gordon, let's see him down there. He makes contact with Sterling Marlin. And the 97 car makes contact with Jeff. Oh. He goes down through the grass. I mean, even check. <laughs> just Joe, even yeah. check. Pit road is closed because a number of the cars involved in the accident crashing down onto the pit entry. They want to make sure they've got all the metal picked up and other debris. So we'll take a break, come back for the caution flag pit stops in just a moment. Only 16 laps to go in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Well, welcome back to Daytona pit stops that could decide the race. Dale Earnhardt Jr., the leader, is in. Much debate about two or four tires. They decided to go the safe route with four tires, and they will still win the race off pit road, barely beating Mike Wallace. Nice job, nice job, nice job guys. See what NASCAR has to say about that. You see that white line right in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s pit. All he has to do is bump the clutch and get the car across that line. That was close. And that locks in his position in the uh, pit exit order. So we'll see what they where they position people from well, that. I don't know if the seven took four or two tires on that stop. Had to be two. Yeah. Yeah. Had to be two. Yeah. And four tires. That's the right move. Jeff Gordon still getting attention. One of the seven cars involved in the wreck just a moment ago off turn four. Kevin Harvick, we saw the damage on the right front. They're trying to put a piece of aluminum over that. Now, let's see. Look at the white line coming out of pit road off the pit stops. That line, who got there first? I don't know. That's... 
I couldn't tell because you, Benny? Nope, up for NASCAR to decide. <laughs> That's why they get the big bucks. So Mike Wallace, for now, defending his position in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr. on the track, but Jr. trying to drop the hint that he thinks maybe he got out first. <laughs> Seen this on many, well now. Yeah, he was just told. He was told by his team. I, I didn't hear NASCAR oh, tell yeah, him. Yeah. No. Here comes Mike back. I didn't hear NASCAR. But the big, the big winners in all this are the orange car and the green car right there. Bobby Labonte in the green car and Tony Stewart in the orange machine. They have made their pit stop. They just changed two tires, but they have that track position they've been looking for all night long. Here are the cars involved in the crash. Adding Jason Leffler to the list that we gave you earlier. Mark Martin, one of the Noble Five drivers with the shot at the million dollar bonus tonight. All triggered with Kurt Busch into the back of Mike Skinner as Mike Wallace slowed to get to pit road. Dave Burns. Well, and Alan, uh, Sterling Marlin is helping orchestrate whatever fixes they might make here. Sterling, do you think you can make do you think you can make fixes at all here and get back in? I don't know. It broke something on the steering. I didn't have any steering and uh, couldn't turn the layoff. Something's broke somewhere. But I hate to follow the crew a lot, guys. We had a pretty good call. It's just uh, tight and loose at times. I don't know what happened. Somebody got in somebody. What was the first reaction you had? Uh, did you? Did your spotter didn't even have time to tell anything, did you? No, nah, it looked, looked to me like Skinner cut somebody off to get in the pits and turned him sideways and went on where it forced to go. But, uh, that's what you get with these rules. Everybody's on top of each other. And I pray the good Lord they change these rules. Just can't race. All right, strong opinion from Sterling Marlin on the aerodynamic rules that they have in the cars here, as well as the restrictor plate racing. Alan? Sterling Marlin, fifth in the championship coming into this race. He'll take a big hit in points tonight. 14 laps to go at Daytona. NBC's coverage of the Pepsi 400 is brought to you by Budweiser. With the crisp, clean, refreshing taste you'll find in no other beer, this Bud. Good, serious technology, freedom from worry. By the Home Depot, the official home improvement warehouse of NASCAR. And by Pepsi, the choice of victory lane. All right. An early fan, and he's here at the racetrack. He's not even watching at home. Championship standings, Jeff Gordon leading Dale Jarrett by 126 coming into the race. But there you see if the race were to finish as it is now. Now yeah, Ricky Rudd will move into second spot, only 106 points behind Jeff Gordon. Gordon running in 24th, Jarrett in 21st, and Rudd in 11th on the racetrack at the moment. Take a break while the track cleanup continues and get back for the final frantic scramble to the finish in the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. NASCAR on NBC at Daytona International Speedway. The Pepsi 400 is down to its final 12 laps. They're making preparations for the big celebration in victory lane. The question is, who will be making the turn through the gates? I don't know. The whole running order has been jumbled by the caution coming out for the crash in the middle of the green flag pit stops. Johnny Benson is the leader of the race. Benson made his pit stop under green at lap 141, stayed on the lead lap, and was in front of Bobby Labonte and the other guys who'd already stopped when the caution came out. So Benson's the leader. Dave Blaney is second. Third is Ken Schrader. Jeremy Mayfield is fourth. Tony Stewart, fifth. Then Bobby Labonte, sixth. Dale Earnhardt Jr. back in seventh place. And by the way, he did beat Mike Wallace off the pit lane. So it's Jr., then Mike Wallace, then Rusty Wallace, and Ward Burton. Going to be 11 laps to go. What do you think? I think they better look out for Jr. because he'll be coming and he will have fire in his eye. This young man wants this one tonight badly. He wants to end up where we saw that picture just a moment ago in victory lane. And we talked about the big wreck and how the closer we got to the finish, the higher the probability. These guys are really going to be on edge right now. Yes. Yeah, we might have another big one here before this is over. 11 laps to settle the Pepsi 400. Here we go.
deals when you're making deals. On board with Dale Earnhardt Jr. Dives to the inside. Not room there. Besides wisely decides to back up a little bit. Got it clear of the lap cars first. Joe Nemechek, the 33, was up alongside Benson, the leader. He was the first one to lap down. Boy, Junior wants to go to the inside so badly. He doesn't have any choice now. He dives down to the inside. Better watch the out-of-bounds line. Off the trial, well, the temptation will be great to try and go under Elliott and Nemechek. Caution's out. Trouble off turn four. Jeff Gordon's car smoking heavily. Looks like he's made contact with the outside retaining wall. That's on board with Jeff Gordon, and you can see that we can't see much. Yeah, nothing much to see. While they are racing back around toward the caution, they're being told the drivers are by NASCAR that they've already taken the caution. It was out when they got here the first time, so slow down. A huge, huge break for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Yes. Because on the restart, uh, the cars will line up single file. Those lap cars will go back to the 25th position where they're running on the racetrack. And now he can race these guys for the lead, and he's shown all night that he has a very fast race car. The problem is, is he going to run out of time? If you're new to NASCAR, there is a rule called the 10-lap rule. Once you get inside the final 10 laps of the race, if there's a restart, only the cars on the lead lap go to the front of the pack and line up in single file. So Joe Nemechek's role on that last restart won't be there the next restart. And that's a very important rule, and I'm glad to see it, especially on the restrictor plate races, because we've seen so many times the big crash, the other big crash happen on a restart getting towards the end of the race. All right, hey, let's Dale find out. Dale Earnhardt Jr. was seventh spot. I mean, he actually started 14th. Here's Jeff Gordon, and we see. I don't think he hit the wall, Benny. Doesn't look like it, does it? I think some damage from that earlier crash maybe cut an oil line or something. I think he looks like he cut a tire. Matt Yoakum, what happened to Gordon? The guys jumped off the pit box. They were getting ready to head back to the garage, and Gordon said the car is still running, but it does not have a lot of oil pressure. Maybe it cut an oil line. Robbie Loomis told him to bring the car to pit road. We'll see what we can do. Possibly we can fix it. There are a few laps left. Possibly we can save some points out of this, Alan. So Jeff Gordon, the championship's leaders, troubles continue. Nine laps to go at Daytona. We'll take a break and come back and see how it turns out in a minute. The Pepsi 400 at Daytona draws down to a precious few final laps. Eight to go, we're under caution came out when something looks like an oil line came out from underneath Jeff Gordon's car. Johnny Benson is the leader. Benson got the lead by being on the racetrack when the caution came out, having already made a pit stop. Question is, did he get two tires, four tires? Dave Burns, what was it? Well, we'll ask James Ince. They are on strategy right now. James, when you came on under green on pit road, did you take on two or four tires? Uh, we took on right side tires, and that's not really a concern to us. This, uh, this car's always done pretty good on two tires. About one, two races last year here on two tires. So, you know, we'd rather be leading right now with two than be back in the back with four. And you've been dumped to the rear before at the end of a race like this. How do you keep that from happening this time? Well, let's see. They're gonna, if it gets dumped to the rear, it's going to be backwards into the fence because they come by. They're going to have to hit it hard. All right, Johnny Benson wants to win. Let's go to Marty. Well, Dave, Tony Uri Sr. is the crew chief for Dale Earnhardt Jr. You've led 111 laps tonight, but it seems like time might be running out. He's sitting back there with caution laps counting away. Yeah, uh, this situation is that nobody likes to see on a plate race call. They'll be five wide when they come back. Now you know telling what's going to happen. Uh, definitely, best man's probably not going to win this race. It's, uh, ain't no telling what's going to happen. Do you think he will not win the race? Because he said on the radio, I think we can get past him. Well, we definitely got the car to pass him. And uh, we're definitely going to give it a try. And uh, if that Budweiser Chevy will get there, we're going to get there. But uh, this plate racing stuff, it's all with who's in front of you and who's behind you or whatever. So you don't have no control of your own destiny. Uh, if we can get there, we'll get there. If we can't, <laughs> hey, we know who had the fastest car tonight. From cars behind him, he has been promised help, but he does not know if he's going to be able to get to the front in time. Oh, man, six laps to go when they throw the green flag. And it, passing on the restricted plate racetracks is a tough thing to do. We've seen cars unable to pass him all night long, but we haven't seen how easily he can pass. 
tell you what, too, you got three guys up there in the top three right now. Two of them have not won a race. One hasn't won a race in a long time. I'd be making deals with each other, saying, guys, let's not let some of these guys that win every weekend win one of these races. Let's run together, run some laps, and last lap every man for himself. All right, bottom line, can Dale Jr. win this race? Yes. You're thinking about it too long. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, like Tony said, if they get three, four wide on the backstretch, anything can happen, and it will. Well, now he still has a shot. Let's talk about the desperation factor, okay? The first two, Johnny Benson and Dave Blaney, have never won a Winston Cup race. Ken Schrader hasn't won the third place car since 1991. Tony Stewart, running fifth, is one of the drivers eligible for the million dollar bonus. <laughs> got five very hungry men sitting up there right now. Yes. The Plus train. Jeremy Mayfield who's in there and those guys all in front of Dale Jr. Behind Dale Jr. to help him draft. Mike Wallace, Bobby Levante, Rusty Wallace, Ward Burton. I'm sure he'd love to see Michael Waltrip or Steve Park somewhere close to him. But Michael's back in 14th and Park is in 22nd. I don't think Dale needs all anybody. Right, get all the gears. Seven laps off. left. Now it'll be six as they come to the start finish line. Time to settle the Pepsi 400 at Daytona. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Flag, is sixth flag, in line and Benson down, leads down, on the restart. Down. Once again, you can't pass on the inside if you get to that line. All right, it's free game. Let's go. Ward Burton quickly down to the inside to try and grab a spot. We see Jeff Gordon back on the racetrack. Earnhardt Jr. lag back trying to get him a run. He has that run, but Tony Stewart pulls up in front of him. He's got, got Jeremy Mayfield. He's, 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 he's got time, I guess. Schrader pushed to the outside lane. 20 cars, the only one upstairs. He's still outside. Look at still Jr. There, go. There, up clear, to fourth. Clear. Here comes Bobby Labonte pushing through. Junior to the outside of Mayfield for third. Seven's coming with you. Seven's coming. Seven's Mike Wallace coming. Coming with him. We can hear Ty Norris telling him he got help on the outside, Junior. There's Blaney block in the 93. And what about Benson? They're going to stay on the bottom of the racetrack. I think they're going to give the outside to Junior. Jeff Gordon getting black flag by NASCAR. There, Here's Dale there. Jr. to the outside of Dave Blaney for second spot. Mayfield pushes him along in the draft. Still there, still there. To the outside for the lead in turn four. Still Dale Earnhardt Jr. rockets there. to the front still at there. Daytona. Listen to the crowd. And look at this crowd there. behind him. Look at this All race there. behind him. And Tony Stewart gets thrown underneath the yellow go. line. Tony Stewart will be black flagged by NASCAR. Okay, black flag for Tony Stewart for going below the out of bounds line. All clear, all clear. And Tony Stewart is in second spot with a million dollars on the line. Okay, 20 is coming, but you're all clear, all clear. Here comes Bobby Labonte. He's got a million dollars on the line as well. It's Michael Waltrip who's pushing him toward the front. And Labonte's underneath the yellow line on the back stretch. This thing's not over yet. Michael Waltrip trying to become the first man to sweep a season at Daytona since 1982. He's up to third. 18-15 behind you. Three laps to go. Ward Burton dives low. Low, but you're clear. I'll tell you one thing. If Junior was running three-quarter throttle, all that ended because he's running wide open right now. Ward Burton rocketing toward the front. Look at him on the outside. Outside of Michael Walter for third. Here's Elliot Sadler up to fifth. Where'd he come from in the Wood Brothers car? He's me. Frantic, intense racing in the final laps at Daytona, but it's still Dale Earnhardt Jr. out in front. They've got to take the win away from him. Tony Urey Jr. is clapping, saying, come on, Jr., come on. Two to go. And Dale Earnhardt Jr. trying to block, trying to keep those cars behind him, desperately trying to keep them behind him. 
He runs so good through the corner, he lets him get a run on him down the straightaway. Michael oh, Waltrip dives underneath Bobby Labonte. They bump on the backstretch. Waltrip to second. Elliott Sadler and Rusty Wallace with him. John behind you. Now, two team cars race in the one and two positions. That's who Dale needs to see in his rearview mirror right now. That's the best thing he can see. Will Michael Waltrip block for Dale Jr.? Will he try to win the race himself? White flag is out. Final lap at Daytona. 180,000 on their feet, screaming wildly. Two and a half miles to go. Just exactly the opposite of the Daytona 500. It was 15 and 8. Elliott Sadler is trying to keep Bobby Labonte behind. He can't do it. But he does move down in front of Rusty Wallace on that fast line. A clear, a clear. Bobby Labonte looking for some help, trying to get up there. His teammate, Tony Stewart, has never answered the black flag. And they're four wide back between the Wallace boys. Here they come, turn four, final lap of the Pepsi 400. Michael Waltrip in second, but it's going to be Dale Earnhardt Jr. using lessons learned from his father to go from sixth to first and score the victory in the Pepsi 400. That's, uh, that's unbelievable. Yes! That man behind you did it for yes. you. You guys celebrate. You love you, man. You did it. That was beautiful. Very, was. very nice. Junior, you're happy. All right. You Look at that awesome. smile. Wow. I don't think there's anybody here that didn't want to see that. Sentimental favorite, emotional favorite. Earlier in the broadcast, we talk among ourselves some of the moves he made on the track today. Looked like his father behind the wheel. I am speechless. Cheers. Pretty cool. Marty Snyder's on pit road with Tony Urey, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s crew chief. And you wouldn't believe the emotion, the tears out here for Dale Earnhardt Jr. If that wasn't like the old man, I don't know what was, Tony Sr. Hey, he had a good teacher. He, uh, he told him a lot about this place. He loves this place. Hell, listen to them fans up there. They love that kid to death. I saw you look to the heavens with a few laps to go. What did you say? Well, he said he knew he could beat them. We just didn't know what was going to happen. Huh? Remember when we've seen this before? <laughs> and Steve Mills joining the fray now. Yeah, man, D.I.'s tough. D.I.'s tough. We can celebrate. <laughs> What a finish at Daytona. Dell Jr. on top of the car in the infield. The 1998 Daytona 500, when his father finally won the Great American Race, he threw the car into the grass doing victory donuts. Everybody joining in the celebration. That's Chocolate Myers, longtime crewman for Dale at Richard Childress Racing. Six to first in the final six laps. All right, Mikey, you celebrate too. You never got to celebrate your win in February. You celebrate now. Man, that's just so cool. Storybook ending. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Junior, getting together. 
Now he's got to get it back over to Victory Lane. Let me tell you something, guys. He went to exactly the right place. Yes, exactly the right place. I don't know how he knew to do that, but that's where he needed to go. <laughs> and that poor NASCAR official is responsible for that car to make sure it gets through tech inspection cleanly. There had to be about 300 people around it down there on the grass. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is our winner, and Chevy congratulates him. And the number eight, Monte Carlo, on a big win tonight. And he'll tell you the only thing that comes close to Monte Carlo's reputation on the track is its reputation on the street. Monte Carlo, more champions depend on Chevy. We'll be there. To victory lane and Bill Weber. Senior, Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> These friends of yours? Man, I just don't know what to say. I'm wore out. I can't think. Uh, I guess I gotta thank my buddy Tony, my crew chief, for hanging in there with me. All my friends, all the guys on the crew, Budweiser, Remington. I got to talk all night. How did you get to the front after the restart? I had a great car. It was all a car, 100%. I just hold on. Yeah. You've learned a few things through the years, though, haven't you, from certain people? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he was with me tonight. I, I don't know how I did it, but he was there. And Mike will help me. I guess we're even now. You told Marty Snyderdale you felt lonely on Father's Day, and there were times that you wanted to cry, but you couldn't. Did you cry tonight? I'll be crying sooner or later. I don't know, I feel so good right now. I'm wore out there. You know when your dad got his first win at Daytona? Huh. His first Winston Cup points win came 11 years ago today, July 7th, 1990. So special. I dedicate this win to him. I mean, there ain't nobody else that I could dedicate it to that it would mean more to me. I want to say hey to Teresa back home. I hope she's loving this, because we sure are. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Now here comes Steve Park, his teammate who won at Rockingham after we lost Dale Earnhardt here. So the celebration here continues. Let's go to Matt. And back in February, it was Michael Walter pushed to victory lane by Dale Earnhardt Jr. Did you pay back that favor tonight? Was that the game plan, Michael? I just wanted Dale Jr. to win so bad, and I wanted to be a part of it. I didn't want to finish 10th or 12th. And uh, the Napa Auto Car Spirit of America hot rod was running. And it was really fast. But uh, I was committed to Dale Jr., just like he was to me in February. And I'll tell you when I really learned a lesson, when I was running third, protecting Dale Jr. and Rusty, and that's what Dale was doing in February. That's that's a handful. They were all over me, but I just I stayed committed. I wasn't about to bail out on them. And uh, Dale Jr. called me on Monday morning after Daytona 500, and he said, "I'm there for you, brother." And he was. And uh, I just wanted to be part of it with him. On top of the car, you two embrace, and then you were talking in each other's ears. What were you saying to each other? This is what it's all about. We all, we both, were so excited about coming to Daytona. This place is a part of our lives more so than any other place in the world. We weren't more emotional than normal, we were just normal. As normal as we can be since we lost our friend. But um, we were excited about racing, and then to have it in like that, it was cool being on top of the car with Dale Jr., but he's young and they butt heads. I think I'm gonna have a headache. Then he dove off the car, and I think I weigh more than everybody on my team, so I didn't want to hurt them or me. So I crept off and cruised over here. Thanks to Klausner Furniture, Ritz Crackers, Coca-Cola, Chevrolet, Goodyear Tires, and especially Napa Auto Parts, the greatest sponsor in NASCAR. Thank y'all. A special night, a special victory for Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. Alan? Dale Earnhardt Jr. becomes just the 38th driver in this track's long history to earn the right to go to victory lane and hold the Daytona Winners Trophy. What a drive. What a performance. Final results in the Pepsi 400. Elliott Sadler, outstanding third place run. I don't know where he came from in those last 20 laps. Mike Wallace will finish in 11th spot. 
Dale Jarrett, 13th. Ricky Rudd, 15th. Gain a lot of points on the points leader, Jeff Gordon tonight. And let me just mention that Tony Stewart, I told you he never answered the black flag. While he's listed in sixth at the moment, he is under penalty, and NASCAR hasn't determined where his final finishing position is yet. I can assure you it won't be in sixth, though. The celebration will continue long on into the night with that young man, I assure you. What a way to return to Daytona. So much has been made throughout the week of what he would go through having to come here. He's gone through the best he could possibly. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has won the Pepsi 400. We'll come back in just a minute. Back at Daytona as the celebration continues in victory lane. Time for us to pick the autotrader.com moves of the race. Can there be any question? Well, don't move the camera. Just leave it right there at that young man. That's my vote. Dale Earnhardt Jr. I second that one. That was incredible. Restarted sixth with six laps to go and won the race and took the lead with four laps to go. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Let's go to Dave Burns. Bobby Labonte has been standing down here, television producing, chatting with crew chief Jimmy Makar. You're really loose. Are you relieved this is over? Well, yeah, of course we are, you know. And, uh, you know, tonight I raced about eight laps all night long. And uh, that doesn't that doesn't seem right, does it? But, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, it was a great deal for Dale Jr. and, and Michael Waltrip and DEI and all them guys. And uh, you know, that's what it was about here, you know. The racing on my part wasn't much other than, you know, right there at the end, uh, Jimmy and them made a great call for Tony and I to pit. They had that caution, which, you know, any, anything could happen, and we got track position there, and that's what you needed because uh, you can't hardly pass sometimes, and uh, you can get boxed in. And With that restart, I was uh, running third there, or uh, running up front and uh, running second to D, uh, Junior, and uh, Michael Walter got by me. He had a really fast race car, so I slid back to fifth, which is a better night. Probably should have been tonight, so can't complain too much other than what did I do, you know. Well, the Pontiacs tonight sure weren't bad race cars. They were just playing good strategy till the end. Marty? Well, day before tonight, Elliot Sadler's best finish at Daytona was 18th, and I think Alan Bestwick said it best. Where'd you come from, anyway? I don't know, man. I tell you, we had a pretty good call night. Just stuck back in traffic, and right at that last caution, we took on four tires. I left pit road, and I beat Michael off pit road, and I pulled over and let him go. I said, boys, he's going to the front. I'm going to follow him, and I just stuck on Michael, and he pulled me right to the front. Man, we finished third. Just a great job for Motocraft, everybody on Wood Brothers. I can't think of a better night. I'm more excited here and more nervous than I was at Bristol. Congratulate Dale Jr. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather see win the race. He did a great job. Man, we feel like we won the race, finished the third. Only his second career top five. The other one was the win at Bristol. Back upstairs. <laughs> great run for Elliott Sadler. Want to go back and take another look at the situation with Tony Stewart. We talked about the out-of-bounds line. And that if you went below the out-of-bounds line, trying to improve your position, you were going to get black flag. So the question is, was Stewart hit from behind? Did he choose to go down to the inside? How did it work? Well, the, this is the restart. This is the restart, and it happened, I guess, the next lap. Yeah. So when he comes back around to turn four, we're going to see him go below the line. Well, that, yeah, that's just that's just in turn one. He goes below the line when they come off of turn four back toward the tri-oval. And the question is, was he intentionally trying to improve his position by going down there or not? I think that someone kind of forced him down there. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that, Benny. It looked like he moved down there to make some, you know, evasive action there. So here, there we see Dale Jr. going by Tony Stewart. And here's Mike Wallace now, on the inside. Tony's going to cut low here. All right, we're coming up on the incident. <laughs> Is it this lap or is it the next lap? Well, I guess it's the next lap. Well, while we look for that, we'll tell you that what the drivers were told in the pre-race driver's meeting was that if you went down under the line intentionally trying to improve your position, you would be black flag. Now, the question is, in NASCAR's call, in NASCAR's judgment, was he intentionally trying to improve his position when he went downstairs, or was he forced down there to keep from running over somebody? NASCAR's call was, he went down there trying to improve his position, so he was put under the black flag. We'll straighten it out after the break. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s won the Pepsi 400. We'll come back to Daytona in a minute. 
Back at Daytona, where the Pepsi 400 spectators are enjoying a fireworks show on Independence Weekend. Had a little fireworks at the finish of this one, too. Involving Tony Stewart, we have found the incident in question now, and we show it to you. This is coming off of turn four into the tri-oval, and he's racing Johnny Benson in the 10 car. Looks like he just gets a really good run on the 10 car. Starts to cut underneath him. 10 car comes down a little bit. Man, that's a tough call, Benny. What it is think? a tough call, but Tony Stewart clearly was underneath the yellow line. Now, the decision that you've got to make is, did Johnny Benson force him down there, or did, it, did he go down there of his own free will? And he forced that that angle. He sure drove him down there. Benson kind of ran him down there. And Tony Stewart did not back off the gas. He gets down below the yellow line. NASCAR black flags him. That's Greg Zipidelli, Tony Stewart's crew chief. The man in the middle is Gary Nelson, the Winston Cup Series director. And the man with his back to you is the team owner, Joe Gibbs. To me, it looked like if Tony would have got out of the gas there, it would have been a wreck. So avoid getting down there. Joe's um, argued with his share of referees and the course of his time. <laughs> He's got his hands full there. Matt Yoakum has more, Matt. Well, the fireworks do continue down here, Alan. I spoke to Greg Zipidelli, Tony's crew chief, right before Gary Nelson from NASCAR walked up. He said, we know he was forced down there by the 10. We saw it on the video the first time. That's what Tony also told us. But we have to get our point across to NASCAR. We are hoping that we can get some video to show Gary Nelson. And just then, Gary Nelson walked up. The coach, Joe Gibbs, is also pleading the case for the 20 team. Very very forceful as you can see he is talking to gary nelson gary is listening but they're hoping to get this resolution here resolved uh, in, in their favor all right well while we wait to find out exactly where it is that tony stewart is going to finish in this uh pepsi 400 we'll come back around and talk about dale earnhardt jr what a night i mean all of the build-up coming into this what would it be like coming back to daytona for the first time since his father lost his life here in that terrible crash on February 18th. Dale Jr. subject to so much speculation, questioning we ourselves during qualifying the other day, wondering what he was thinking and what he was feeling at that point. We know what he's thinking and feeling right now. Yeah. You know, and he said, Bill Weber asked him, did you cry? And he, and he said, no. Uh, really, I think that's what he said was no. But I'll be, I'm not ashamed to tell you, I shed a tear. I mean, that was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen in this sport. You know, Bill Weber asked me at a preview show, what's been the most exciting thing the first half of the season? Well, this overshadows anything that might have happened in the first half. Wally, there are some races along the line that as a driver, if you can't win, you're happy to see somebody else win. No question. Uh, you know, I think there's about 42 other guys that was done exactly the same thing that Michael did. It was, it was so cool to see Michael go up there, return the favor from the Daytona 500, and I'll guarantee you Dale Jr. wanted this race. He may not have been shown it emotionally, but he wanted to win this race badly. Daytona's always been a place for me of, of magic, of excitement, a, a wonderful place to come for an automobile race. When we left here February 18th, it was the darkest I've ever remember leaving a racetrack. And this does so much for those thousands of spectators, millions of Dale Earnhardt fans who need a piece of closure for Daytona. Maybe the same for Dale Earnhardt Jr. Obviously not as simple a situation for him, but perhaps this can offer the Dale Earnhardt fans some closure where this racetrack Daytona is concerned.